Everyone's very quiet all of a sudden. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Journalism Under Siege, a unique event being held in this remarkable space, the Carlton Dominion Chalmers Center. Thank you for joining us in person for a change or uh, through the broadcast. My name is Alan Thompson. I'm the head of the Carleton University Journalism Program, your host for this evening. I'd like to note off the top that this important event is being sponsored by Carleton's Faculty of Public Affairs, represented here this evening by our Dean, Dr. Brenda O'Neill. Let me also begin by acknowledging that Carleton University and this majestic space are located on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Nation. And for those who are joining us virtually, let me encourage you to be mindful of the territory on which you live and work. This event is called Journalism Under Siege. We'll talk more about that later. <laughs> Journalism as a profession was already in some measure under siege, even before the unprecedented events of the last month in Ottawa. But the protests mounted by the self-described Freedom Convoy in downtown Ottawa, something that Ottawa's police chief described as a siege, presented a multitude of challenges for the journalists trying to make sense of these events. As Canada's original journalism school, we thought it was important to hold a conversation about what those few weeks meant for our profession and how journalism serves the public. I want to thank our panelists for being so quick to respond and so generous with their time. This is the first time we've had a chance to get together, face to face, to compare notes. And it was important to do it here in the heart of downtown Ottawa. It was also important to hold this event as soon as possible. The world is a tumultuous place and we are already immersed in another crisis, on a much grander scale, in Ukraine, where we find ourselves turning to journalists to try to understand the full gravity of the day's events. Many of the journalists who covered the convoy became the target of jeers, insults, and sometimes even physical assault. While journalists, especially women and journalists of color, have long been accustomed to online harassment. This kind of behavior seems to have reached new levels. It's a worrisome trend that we have to discuss. But public trust in the media has also been eroded. We saw that during the events on the Hill. It was both striking and distressing for me as a career journalist to talk to people, uh, talk to those among uh, those who were protesting downtown and to realize that some live in an alternate reality when it comes to the news media. And I don't mean that in an, in an insulting way. There is a growing divide in this country, and that is something that we also have to discuss. We need to talk about notions of media objectivity, media bias, safety for individual journalists who found themselves operating in a hostile environment in the shadow of the Peace Tower. It's important for us to discuss how journalists went about their work, how they used technology, how they made decisions about the stories they were telling, and what lessons they draw from this experience. No matter what side of this issue you find yourself on, and there are many, no one can contest that those three weeks when much of downtown Ottawa found itself under siege were unprecedented in this country. With us here tonight, we have a cross-section of journalists who lived and breathed these important events for several weeks running. Another journalist who couldn't be with us this evening because of other plans is gonna join us by video. And we are fortunate to have, as a moderator, Carleton journalism professor Adrian Harewood, a fixture on the media scene in Ottawa, his hometown. In a moment, Adrian will set the stage for the evening, introduce our speakers, and then invite each of our panelists to share brief opening remarks. There will be some discussion among the panelists, led by Adrian, followed by a question and answer period. We will do our best 
to get to those questions in the room here tonight to give you a chance to pose your question. Someone will be walking around with the microphone. They'll hang on to the microphone and give you a chance to put your question. For those who are participating virtually, please use the Q&A function on the webinar to pose questions. I'll be monitoring those from my little station down here, and every now and then I will pop up with a question uh, for the panel. With that, let me thank you again and turn this evening over to Adrian Harewood, who I think is going to operate from, I will. from this vantage point. I can. I okay. can. Okay. Adrian. Okay, thanks so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alan, and it's certainly a delight, it's an honor, it's a privilege for me to uh, be serving as your moderator for this evening. So welcome to those of you who are joining us online, and of course, those of you who are here with us at Dominion Chalmers tonight. Let me begin by saying how good it is to see you. All right, it's good to see people um, after so long. Uh, people are always disappointed when they see me because they realize I'm not that tall. <laughs> Someone, someone said that, tonight. You're, so, you're not that tall, anyway. Um, but I'm seeing faces in the crowd that I, I literally have not seen for years, and, and it's really great to, great to see you. We've missed these opportunities uh, to commune during this global pandemic. Uh, we've missed coming together to exchange and wrestle with ideas, to debate in a public forum like this. And so collectively, collectively, I think we appreciate how precious, how valuable these moments are. So while tonight's discussion uh, may at times get tense, they may be difficult, they may be painful, um, people will feel frustration and they might feel consternation. Tonight is an unapologetic celebration of the resilience of our community and we are still here. And we've assembled a stellar panel tonight of some of this country's most respected journalists uh, to discuss and reflect on how they experienced an extraordinary moment in Ottawa's and indeed in Canada's history. For a number of days, just a few short weeks back, the eyes of the world were on us, on our nation's capital. Whatever you call what took place between January 28th and February 20th in the city's downtown core involving the Freedom Convoy, whether you labeled it a blockade, a demonstration, a protest, an occupation, a siege, whether you thought the events of those weeks were peaceful or violent or something in between, whether those days of demonstration, occupation, protest, and siege left you feeling exasperated, incensed, inspired, exhilarated, exhausted, bewildered, energized, or depressed, we know that what happened, what took place, was unprecedented. We know that it has already changed the city of Ottawa. And we know that it has changed the country, and that it might be a sign of change in our politics, but also a sign of change, or perhaps the confirmation that the relationship between the Canadian public and journalists, the Canadian public and the mainstream media has fundamentally changed. We want to try to understand what happened and we will be led on this journey by six individuals who are on stage with us tonight and one individual who will appear on the big screen. Judy Trin is sitting beside me right now. I normally sit behind Judy uh, in the newsroom at CBC Ottawa. Uh, but Judy is an investigative reporter with CBC, and during the three-week-long occupation, uh, she provided some of the most detailed coverage of the Ottawa Police Services and the Freedom Convoy encampment on Coventry Road in Ottawa's East End. Rupa Subramania is a columnist for the National Post. Unfortunately, Rupa can't be with us tonight, uh, but she was a prominent voice on the ground throughout the weeks-long demonstration. Justin Ling is sitting beside Judy tonight, and Justin is a freelance investigative journalist. His reporting during the occupation and his social media presence on Twitter was certainly mandatory reading for anyone following the events. And Justin's expert reporting on extremist groups behind the siege was sought out by The Guardian and CBC's The Fifth Estate. Jorge Barrera is 
another colleague. He works for CBC's Indigenous Unit based out of Ottawa. And at a critical moment during the demonstration in Ottawa's downtown, Jorge waded into the crowd with his mobile phone to report live on his own. Raisa Patel is a national politics reporter for the Toronto Star. She's based in Ottawa. She's a graduate of Carleton University's Journalism School, and she was reporting on the ground throughout the protest. Glenn McGregor is a senior political correspondent for CTV National. He was a constant presence on television screens and on Twitter during the occupation. And like others working with camera crews, was subjected to harassment by some of the protesters. And Justin Tang is a photojournalist, an award-winning photojournalist. He's a contributing photographer to the Canadian press. And certainly anyone who consumed news coverage of the convoy will have seen some of his uh, now iconic images. So this is your panel. And welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. And so we're going to start, we're going to start with, with Judy. Uh, I think each person will speak for about five minutes. And I, I guess I just wanted you to kind of locate yourself in those three weeks. Tell us a little bit about how you experienced you know, the, the Freedom Convoy. Adrian, I, um, I do not live in the downtown core. And I work in the downtown core. So when I go into work and I, and I see what is happening, the one thing that resonated with me was just how angry I felt. I didn't understand it. I just felt, I felt a little bit like um, this, everything that, was, uh, that I held dear in terms of uh, a democracy, uh, in terms of what Canada was, our, our Parliament Hill, was somehow uh, being disrespected. And I think that, uh, you know, if I was to be honest, starting from that point, right, it is, it, we are to be balanced and objective reporters, but we are citizens, I am a citizen of this, of, uh, of Ottawa. So there was, there was that feeling. And then I would talk to my relatives, and my relatives would, would be a, a bit confused about it, because for them it looked like it was just a party, that everyone was just having fun, that it was, uh, that it was, out of control really, but that uh, no one uh, was really getting hurt. And then they, they kept on asking me, but what is driving it? Um, what are the reasons behind it? And I, and I, was, I was looking at the coverage and, and assessing my own reporting. I'm like, what, what is driving it? Why, why are police um, so behind? What, where are the answers? And then I wasn't sure that the answers were on Parliament Hill because these were politicians and they were giving you the political reaction. And what I saw was this paralyzed police force, a very um, inept response, if I can use that uh, word. And I wanted to know why. And obviously the protesters themselves had lots of skills. So, when I wasn't able to get downtown to a certain degree, they were saying, you know, work from home. We don't have, even if you were to report, we don't have security to go out with you. Uh, at CBC, in order to go out uh, as a reporter, you need a one-to-one -one security guard. So your cameraman would have a security guard and the reporter would have a security guard. And uh, there weren't enough. So if you weren't uh, assigned to an actual story that day, you couldn't leave. So I was doing a lot of digging around the scene, so I didn't, I wouldn't have that resource. So then I thought I would just drive where um, to Coventry. And what is interesting about Coventry is that on day one of the protest on Facebook, uh, Tamara Leach actually put out a post in which she said, hi everyone, come down to Coventry. Uh, this is where our base camp's gonna be. You're gonna have uh, toilets here. You're going to have food here. So I had seen this post, but I had not yet seen Coventry. So on day three, I, I was like, I'm going to take a drive. I'm just going to see uh, what's out there. And it was astounding. Hundreds of vehicles, 
uh, the tractor trailers and tents were had gone up already. Uh, they were they were hauling materials in. At that point, there there was no sauna. Um, but what was interesting? What was interesting was I I was just driving by and I wasn't sure what uh, how I was going to be received. So my first my first visit was just in the car, just driving. And I saw what I thought were people in military fatigues. And, but I was, and so that struck a bell. I was like, what is, what is going on? Like, are, are, they, are they just dressed like soldiers? Are they soldiers? Are they veterans? So that kind of became a question that I wanted to answer. And that was what, um, so my first story uh, looked into um, military and police connections. So, we know that um, there, there are sympathies amongst the military, amongst officers, to the convoy protesters. So did that have an impact on their response? And in my reporting, what I, what I revealed was that there was a response. There was a link. There, these protesters were very skilled in the sense that they knew certain, um, they had, they knew what, you know, even if they knew what a military operation looked like, they were organized, right? So for me, that, I wanted people to understand that part of it, that it wasn't just fun, that it was individuals who had these uh, paramilitary skills, who could use it to entrench within the city, who perhaps had access to firearms because we knew that there was no way police could search hundreds of vehicles. They could not, they do not have the grounds for a search warrant. So what was in those trucks? Um, we knew that some of them, uh, you know, we knew that there were um, members of the JTF too. We knew that there were at least uh, 10 active soldiers who were sympathetic to the cause. Were they part of the protest? We don't know, but we knew that they had these skills. So by putting, that type of information out there, at least we knew that this was a real threat. It wasn't just people protesting peacefully for uh, or against uh, vaccine mandates or mass mandates. It was individuals who, if they held extremist views, also had military training, which made them even more dangerous. So that, that was where I started. And, was to answer those questions from friends and relatives who really thought that this protest was about people just blowing off steam and having some fun. Okay, thank you, Judy. I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm not gonna ask because she's not here, but Rupa Subramania has recorded a message and we're going to play her opening remarks. So this is Rupa Subramania from the National Post. I wanted to use this opportunity to actually talk about the way this conversation is being framed and, and how I find that framing, uh, in, in some respects, I find that pr framing problematic. Uh, so let's start with the poster for the event, uh, which, which you know, refers to the protest um, as the so-called Freedom Convoy. So immediately I wondered why so-called, uh, no one said so-called Black Lives Matter, no one said so-called Occupy Wall Street protests. Uh, you don't have to agree with the cause or even like the people who are involved in the protests, but I found that this was a maybe a subtle or a not so subtle put down of, 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 uh, of the movement. Um, it, is, it is called what it is it is called now you can have a separate discussion um, on uh, you know you know on how to unpack the term freedom convoy you can critique that uh, if you wish but i thought that this was uh, you know calling it so called was actually emblematic of a lot of the mainstream coverage of the protests uh, which you know, which featured some snide and mocking, uh, which featured some of the snide and mocking tone. Um, and then next, I wanted to talk about the um, the the poster, uh, which refers to uh, the uh, description of the poster of, of, for this event, which refers to the occupation, uh, which refers to the protest as an occupation of Ottawa, and it uh, and and it refers to 
the protests as a siege on the nation's capital. Uh, now, when I was reading this, I was thinking, well, are we talking about a city in Ukraine besieged by Russian troops? Or are we talking about Ottawa, a G7 capital, which, which saw what I thought was an act of nonviolent uh, civil disobedience? Um, and I do, I do want to acknowledge that there, are, there were residents in Ottawa who felt that this was some kind of an occupation um, and some kind of a siege. But I also found that we were only referring to this in the, sing in the singular term uh, without offering any other alternative lenses through which you could see this as being de deb debated. Um, and this was the singular lens and without acknowledging that there are other alternative lenses out there, I thought that was I thought was particularly problematic. Um, and I felt that the premise of the panel itself had been prejudged uh, from its terms of reference, uh, that this was an occupation and a siege. Um, and um, and it, it, it differs wildly with uh, folks like me who were there, um, who saw this through the lens of civil disobedience civil disobedience. I should note that I'm, I'm originally uh, from India, a country that uh, invented civil disobedience in its modern form. So whether it was Gandhi's resistance to British rule or Indian farmers' resistance to farm reforms that blockaded uh, highways for more than a year in India, which, by the way, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau supported uh, quite vocally uh, to the Freedom Convoy um, that uh, recently, I think these are all forms of civil disobedience. And by, defi and by definition, civil disobedience is going to be uh, noisy and disruptive. Um, the real test is, does it remain peaceful and nonviolent? And I found it to be largely peaceful and entirely nonviolent. Um, now, if you, if you, if it's, if the worst you can say about the Ottawa protests were noise and park, parking and fractions, then I think, I think we're, they were safely on the side of nonviolent protests. And actually not that different from these farmers protests that I mentioned in India, which uh, uh, dragged on for about a year where trucks and uh, tractors blocked roads and highways in India. Um, and I remember, I remember uh, you and I having a conversation a few days ago about the title of the, uh, uh, of the event, Journalism Under Siege. And, um, and I thought it was a little self-indulgent because it seemed to make this about the journalists, but not but not with what was actually going on, which, which was the Freedom Con Convoy. And I think it was one of, perhaps one of the most important cultural moments in this country's history, uh, no matter what you think of, think of the protests or the people involved in it. Uh, but I agree with your, I, but, you know, but, I, but your interpretation of it is also a valid one, which is you could see this as perhaps a crisis in journalism and how do we confront this crisis? How do we deal with that crisis? So I do take it in that spirit as well. Uh, so I guess I think, um, you know, I found the framing of this conversation for this event as interesting as the subject itself. Uh, the framing uh, pointed to a particular narrative um, and a particular lens through which to see the protests, which is, by the way, not that different from what the PM and the Ottawa City Councilors and large sections of the media, um, uh, you know, how they saw it. Uh, I felt that they were all marching in lockstep. Again, um, in my opinion, if, if the media is largely seen as mirroring the message coming from politicians, Those were, those were Rupa's comments, and I should just say for the record that we were in conversation, so I interviewed Rupa on Sunday. Justin. Thank you. Um, yes, so, so for starters, you know, I'm not based in Ottawa. I'm, I'm, I'm based in Montreal most of the time. I have, I have lived and worked here in the past, um, but I, I have not had to experience the day-to-day -day kind of frustrations, for the most part, of this occupation. So I'm going to get that out of the way up front. I got the luxury of taking the train and going back home, which a lot of folks I know didn't. So, you know, uh, I'll start by saying that I, I'm, I think, one of the lucky journalists who got to step out of this when it was sort of convenient. But from the very beginning, when I first saw the, some of the Facebook groups and some of the Telegram channels and whatnot for this so-called Freedom Convoy, and I'm going to come back to the so-called thing in a second because I have a problem with that. But um, when I saw, you know, a bunch of these groups popping up, you know, something jumped out to me 
that this was probably the first real confluence and the first real kind of cooperation that I've seen over the past two years of Canada's disparate networks of anti-vaccine, anti-mask, anti-lockdown groups, right? And I realized that since you know, this thing got underway, there's been this real effort to say, no, 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 no. Listen, this is not, nothing to do with anti-vaccine groups. This is about you know, trucker mandates or vaccine mandates or what have you, which you know, from the very beginning I knew was false. You know, from the very beginning, I'm looking at the organizers, the groups, the activists who put together, who organized this, this convoy, and they're groups I recognize. They're groups I've been following for years. You know, most of what I do as a journalist is follow misinformation, follow conspiracy theories, follow uh, extremist groups. And all of the ones that I've been looking at, and a few that I hadn't even heard of, we're getting together, we're all getting on the same page, and we're saying it's time to go to Ottawa. Now, this includes people who, uh, in recent years, uh, tried an occupation of Ottawa, uh, this is groups who tried to uh, arrest and prosecute Justin Trudeau for treason before the pandemic even began. Uh, these are groups that uh, were either involved with or affiliated with individuals who were trying to perform citizen's arrests of people in downtown Ottawa. Um, hilariously, at one point, trying to arrest a CBC journalist, a Radcan journalist, thinking that they were a member of parliament, which, again, <laughs> civics lessons is something that we need to improve in this country. But, um, you know, I'm following all of these groups and it's just, it's, it's striking to me that this is probably the first time, maybe in North America, that you've seen all of these groups get on the same page, put all of their organizing skills and their followers and their email lists and their Facebook groups pointing in the same direction and trying to enact a single event and Seeing the images of, of these trucks, you know, which did not number 200,000 people as they claimed, but seeing these trucks that actually you know, stretched kilometers coming from out west, coming from out east, I thought to myself, this is going to be bigger than I think anyone totally appreciates. So, of course, I, I booked my Via Rail uh, trip and I, I, I maybe mistakenly booked myself at the Arc Hotel downtown, which also happened to end up, <laughs> it ended up being a, a really uh, <laughs> happening. Uh, convoy hotspot, or what I didn't know that at the time. I thought boutique hotel. I'll, I'll be, I'll be in the clear anyway. Um, so, so you know, when I got to Ottawa just in the Friday, just before everyone kind of sort of started properly arriving, seeing these trucks come in, you know, listening to some of the radio channels, um, following some of the Telegram channels, um, it started to really sink in the degree to which um, you know these folks were were ready to make a stand. These are individuals who for two years now have been hearing propaganda that says masks don't work, COVID-19 is not as serious as they tell you, the government uh, is using uh, this to restrict our civil liberties and perhaps enact a permanent sort of lockdown, uh, and then later that COVID-19 vaccines are dangerous and effective and killing people in scores. And they're getting this information from a totally alternative press, not just an independent press, but a press that exists in a totally alternate reality, one where they get to make up their own facts, interpret their own research, have their own scientists, have their own doctors, and it's a, it's a reality that is totally decoupled from everything we sort of hold true. It is, it is one where if it exists in a major newspaper or in a peer-reviewed journal, it must be false and the opposite must be true. That is literally part of the philosophy that governs what many of these people believe. As they started arriving, um, you know, you could walk and, and you know, speaking of alternate realities, there was sort of a dual reality that existed when the convoy finally arrived and the occupation began. And it was an occupation. They admit it was an occupation. The occupation was the point. They called it a bear hug. They were going to uh, freeze the city of Ottawa, cut off, you know, in, in, at least in, in one, one organizer was telling me they were going to cut off supply to the city and, and basically freeze it and make it impossible for people to go to work or get some sleep. That was the point. So to suggest that it's not an occupation is just completely ludicrous. But you know, walking through the crowd, it was an exercise in living in two different realities. You had the reality where you knew these people were saying vaccines are killing people. Uh, Anthony Fauci created a bioweapon uh, to, to you know, restrict our civil liberties. The World Economic Forum is using this, this, this virus uh, to take over and install a one world socialist government. All things that were repeatedly said, not only by organizers, but by many of the people attending. 
that's reality one. Reality two is you walk around and people are sitting in hot tubs and people are dancing and people are having a wonderful time and people are being nonviolent and are being peaceful and are, as Rupa actually correctly notes, exercising civil disobedience. And it's a tough thing to square. You also, as time went on, had to realize that there was another reality, which is the reality of people who actually live in this city, where they're being constantly harassed for wearing masks where they're feeling constantly unsafe, where they're unable to go to the pharmacy, they're unable to go out their front door, they're unable to get to work, they're unable to take their kids to daycare, they're unable to let their cat out. You know, there was the other reality that this wasn't just frustrating or annoying, it was actually dangerous and damaging to many people who lived in the city. So these three realities are really hard to kind of put together, and it, which is really why I have a problem with, with even Rupa suggesting that this is, you know, that the so-called is sort of a, a put-down. It, you know, it, it is a so-called freedom convoy because this wasn't about freedom. This was about restricting freedom of the people who lived in this city. Um, this was about trying to force our democratically elected government into the decisions that were preferred by this occupation. And fundamentally, this was not about freedom for the country. This was about freedom for unvaccinated people to do something dangerous. That is fundamentally what this was about. They have the right to do it. Did they have the right to do it? Yes. I firmly believe that, that the folks who occupied the city had some limited right to install traffic and to frustrate the hell out of everybody who lived in the city. But there has to be limits to that. And I think fundamentally, you know, what a lot of the work we did was try to highlight the degree to which there needed to be a solution to this. You know, this could not go on forever. You know, we, we were trying our best to underscore, you know, the, the, the sort of dangers, the frustrations, and the damage being caused by this into the city and to highlight how it could be done, how it could be cleared out, how it could be resolved peacefully without acquiescing to these frankly ludicrous demands. And it was a tall order and frankly we didn't always get it right. I actually tend to agree with Rupa strangely that journalism under siege is probably a little bit over the top um, and I think that there's actually probably some blame to be shared between the media, between the politicians for maybe being a little too dismissive of some valid concerns. Um, but fundamentally, this was a really tough story to cover. This is unprecedented. We've never done this before. And I think overall, we did a pretty good job. I'm pretty happy with how my colleagues you know, covered this story. And I think um, there's a lot of uh, you know, accolades to be, to be shared about for it. Thank you, Justin. Jorge. So I'm still working on threads from, from what I consider a movement um, that still exists and, and how it will manifest itself again, um, you know, remains to be seen. So I, I've continued to uh, stay in touch with, with people involved, um, sp still, you know, spending, you know, a few hours just sitting around just last Thursday with someone um, that tried to set up in, in a new location and uh, we ended up uh, having to leave that location, and I, I followed them uh, to someone's private residence uh, several kilometers away, and on the way there, uh, we were followed by, because I was following behind them, there was three OPP SUVs uh, tailing us the whole way, all the way to this private residence's driveway, and they got out um, and, and wanted to know what was going on. So, from right now, for me, I'm I'm really trying to keep an eye on how authorities uh, continue to monitor and, and surveil and, and try to preempt any, you know, renewed uh, surge from from this from this movement. But you know, the way I've I've so I'm just to situate myself where I'm at. I'm still I'm still kind of covering this thing. But what I what I my 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 role that I took in in this was to just try to figure out what brought people um, to Ottawa to, you know, park their trucks there, uh, what brought people to, you know, leave their houses in, in, in uh, Petawawa, for example, and, and drive to Ottawa nearly every day uh, to go down and, and stand with, with, you know, the sometimes several hundred, sometimes thousands of people. And what I found was that there seemed to there seemed to be this complete loss of faith in institutions, a crisis of authority, I think other have termed it, um, for various reasons. Um, they no longer trust 
what you know, official health authorities have to say or what media has to say. And, and like you know, Justin mentioned, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a, a very fragmented information uh, landscape. But part of, part of what I was hearing also reminded me a little bit of what I would hear um, from activists from the left in the late 1990s when the anti globalization movement was, was starting to really surge and the mobilization to go to, start to shut down the WTO and what turned into the battle in Seattle um, where they actually did end up shutting the first day of the WTO meeting there. And, and there's this, this belief that the system uh, no longer looks out or cares uh, for, you know, the common person, even though, you know, the, the, the truckers who were here um, have really large assets. I mean, these, these transport trucks that they had put on the line for this are at the very least 150 grand. And, and some of them had actually paid them off. Mo, mo, a lot of the guys who were here that I spoke to were owner operators. So they were putting their, you know, their life's assets, something that they've worked and paid into uh, for most of their working life on the line um, for what they believe to be um, a government that for whatever, for various reasons believe was either bordering on tyrannical or they believe was overstepping its authority in terms of threatening their livelihood or overstepping its authority by through provincial restrictions, um, even though it was all you know, leveled at the federal government, but the, the notion that health uh, authorities could shut down churches. You know, they, they felt that, you know, the divisions for, because there is a, there's a really strong Christian element to this, uh, a type of sort of evangelicalism that, that is really, um, is, is influenced by American type evangelicalism that's taken on a really political hue um, where, where they, they believe that it's part of their duty to also take political stands as opposed to simply focusing on, you know, growing their own um, communities through, through, converting, through converting souls. So all, you know, there was a lot of different reasons why all this thing, all these people came together. But at the very root of it was a complete uh, loss in faith in the way that the system works. And it, it, it was, and, and they explained it in different ways. You know, one, one woman that I interviewed on the record said, you know, all the parties need to get rid of their party banners and, and we should just be electing individuals. Um, others, you know, would say, you know, I used to really support the Conservative Party, but, and, and actually a lot of the and people I talked to, you know, traditionally voted Conservative. And, you know, the Conservative Party no longer, you know, represents, you know, my views. And there was a lot of, a lot of people who, who looked at Maxime Bernier differently because he allowed himself to be arrested and they saw someone who actually would put his money where, where his mouth is. But beneath that, is this feeling that no one really listens to what they have to say, that, you know, the, the people sitting in Ottawa, you know, don't really care about their views because their views don't fit into certain narratives that they feel that are only acceptable. And so one of the reasons that some people, you know, came to this or would travel from their home, because there's a lot of day trippers that went to the, uh, went, went downtown Ottawa, and that, that helped to, increase the mass of people that were there um, was just simply the, the, you know, the feeling that no one cares what I have to say. I send emails to my MP and no one responds to me. You know, I, I, I call my MP or my MPP or my MLA and no one's listening to me. So they felt that there is a system that's, that's basically oppressing them and is not listening to what they have to say and is now, in terms of the truckers specifically, threatening their livelihood. The, the idea that your work can be tied to a vaccine mandate is actually a legitimate concern um, that the left has raised as well, um, like Jeremy Corbyn has, has talked about that. So it's not sort of out of nowhere that that, that exists. But also within, within the group itself, they, they did create a sort of bubble. And within that, they felt that their energy, just by being there, just by gathering, would win out in the end and when the police came they were completely unprepared because they didn't believe it because they also sort of you know I guess they they um they kind of 
uh, misguided their, themselves that they believed that there was nothing that could stop what they were doing simply because of the pure energy that they thought they were generating. Um, so it's really, for me, it's it, because I spent as much time as I could talking to people, and I realized there's so many different stories that brought everybody. It's really hard to find a theory of everything of why this happened. Um, but the closest thing I could come to personally in sort of my reporting is that this belief that systems and institutions no longer reflect or care about the needs of what they believe to be, you know, the common people, their communities. And I think uh, this is, you know, this was kind of reinforced by some of the language that that was used initially by uh, the federal government and the prime minister and later city councillors, the way that they described this, obviously because of what was happening in their city. But I think as, as journalists, as, as a reporter myself, I, you know, I consider myself a reporter, I, I just go in and, and try to gather uh, the views and characters and try to reflect back what is happening. I think we have to work on trying to build that bridge to to these these groups that are that are scattered all in these these communities these these families these groups of friends that no longer trust us and to figure out why they no longer trust us why there's so much rage against us and to try to build those bridges back try to build up that trust because i i want those individuals who who have told me to my face when i was in there that you know they completely don't believe uh what my organization reports on they think we're all controlled i want to convince them that no you should read my story because no i'm not controlled and no my colleagues are not controlled that we we, we actually are not pushing an agenda we're, we're just trying to do honest reporting and and i think government institutions also have to be uh open to the the need that they have to make the effort to also reach out all parties i mean the conservatives are probably the, the party that's probably well, hurt the most from this based on the people I talked to, but I think this is a, mo a, a moment in time that we need to avoid what's happened in the U.S. with the extreme polarization and try to figure out a way to build bridges. Ryan, thank you. Raisa. So I cover federal politics, and that was sort of the lens through which I was looking through everything. And, you know, thinking back, I think one of the most pivotal days of this convoy was a couple days before it started, I think it was the Wednesday before everyone arrived, and that was the day that Justin Trudeau referred to protesters as you know, a fringe minority, a small fringe minority with unacceptable views, and that was the line that I think colored the entire event, that it was exactly what convoy members were expecting to hear from the prime minister. It emboldened them. It they were ready for him to say something like that. And they showed up on that very first Friday with that, those words written on t-shirts, on signs. They had signs made with those words ready to go, stuck to the side of their trucks. They were screaming it in the streets. We heard that from day one until the very last day of, of the convoy. And still, I'm still hearing, you know, small fringe minority with unacceptable views almost every day. Um, and so that was really interesting, and we, we heard him say that on the Wednesday and, you know, made note of it, but I, I don't think I expected it to blow up in the way that it did, and it was interesting as a reporter to kind of not get sucked into, into that mentality. Like, these are people who think that they're here with very serious concerns, and, and some of their concerns were, you know, reasonable to an extent, and to sort of downplay that and to, to underestimate them was dangerous. And some politicians did that, you know, the convoy members would argue that the media did that, but it was really important for us to, to not play into that. Um, you know, mentioning that my angle was federal politics, I ended up having a very local focus on this event. I'm, you know, born and raised in Ottawa, I lived in Centertown for about six years, and this was a very eye-opening experience for me, not in terms of maybe the sentiment that was expressed or the longevity of the event, but just living in Ottawa forever and never seeing or experiencing anything like this. I live less than a kilometer from Parliament Hill, so I was in the middle of everything um, from, from start to finish. You know, I can remember the sound of that first honk on that Friday and we'll never forget it. Um, but that was a really invaluable experience to me. It was really important that I actually didn't leave Centertown. You know, many people were kind and, you know, said, 
come live with me in another part of the city, and I, I really didn't want to do that. On the one hand, it, you know, I thought I was being exposed to COVID every day, and I had no rapid test, so I, I didn't want to go anywhere. Um, but you know, I, I just sort of felt like residents of Centertown didn't have the privilege of going somewhere else and escaping from this. So if it's my job to bear witness to it, why would I? And it was, it was really eye-opening for me just how trapped I ended up feeling as a resident, and that's you know, a word that I never thought I would use to describe my, my hometown, essentially. You know, I saw exactly what this demonstration was doing to residents of Ottawa, day in, day out, middle of the night, first thing in the morning. You couldn't escape it. You would see it in the grocery store, you know, people getting in fights with security, not wearing masks. I saw it, you know, my walk to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription, you know, people being harassed for wearing a mask and, and talking to residents on the street and, and hearing that they were called slurs or they were followed home or, you know, there was garbage, you know, right in front of their apartment, you know, my apartment building had to hire security. The arson attempt was, was very close to me. So all of that was sort of in the back of my mind. I couldn't use that a lot in my reporting just because I was, I was looking at it from such a national perspective. But when I would go out and talk to, to convoy members, and I, you know, I did that every day, and, and we would go you know, in pairs or with a team and sometimes with security, uh, and I hope my boss isn't listening to this because I would sometimes go by myself uh, when I shouldn't have, <laughs> just because I live there and it was happening you know, at, at all times of day and, and you want to go out and see what's going on. But what really struck me is that when talking to these people, they would say, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. No one here is being aggressive. No one here is, is hostile. You know, we're welcoming everyone with open arms. And, you know, some people, some people did. But that experience sort of gave me the opportunity to say, well, no, you know, I, I've seen it. I've witnessed it. I've experienced it. I'm hearing it every day from, from my neighbors. And so that I think really helped with the accountability aspect. Just, you know, for me, it wasn't secondhand. It wasn't, you know, I saw someone say this on Twitter and maybe it wasn't true or, you know, my friend texted me this. It was no, I was seeing it with my own eyes every single day and experiencing it. And, and that was really uh, invaluable. And, you know, in terms of how we approached covering this event, you know, obviously we had to think of our safety in a number of different ways. Um, but you also really had to think carefully of how you were portraying the event. You know, how much weight would you give to the more hateful elements that we saw compared to the people who had nothing to do with those sentiments? Um, you know, this, this protest was a culmination of a lot of things and, and it brought together, you know, a lot of different kinds of people. There was pandemic exhaustion, anger, frustration, a huge lack of, of trust in the media, some far right elements. You know, these were things that if you weren't paying attention, even though they were bubbling under the surface this entire time, would, would really catch you off guard. And I think this did catch a lot of people off guard. Um, one of the things, one of the, the ways where I was actually able to talk about the local aspect of things a little bit more was on Twitter, on social media. If I couldn't use it in my reporting, then I was, you know, sharing conversations that I had with residents on my Twitter or, or posting pictures or, or videos, talking to grocery store clerks, asking them what they were experiencing. And Twitter was a really interesting space during this time. Um, those tweets ended up being more controversial than anything I was writing in the newspaper or, or any, anything else I've ever done. You know, every single thing that I wrote on Twitter was just instantly declared to be a lie. You know, people started a campaign against me, had been contacting my employer, telling them that I should be fired, uh, you know, sort of digging up things about you, figuring out who, who your family was, um, and it, it led to me having to lock my account for the first time ever. And that's something that I didn't take lightly. You know, I'm, I'm a racialized woman. I experience death threats and, and hate mail all the time, and I've, I've never felt the need to lock my account, but it was out of volume, I think, 
where it, it just didn't feel you know, worth it to sort of be on that platform anymore. And locking your account as a, as a journalist is really interesting because it almost feels like a form of censorship. It means that the public can no longer see your reporting and the things that you're, you're putting out there. And so that was not a decision that I took lightly and I, I had to do that for about a week and, and take a step back for a couple of days. But you know, eventually your, your need to just get your reporting out there supersedes everything and, and I kind of jumped back on. So all that to say, like we've talked a lot about, you know, journalist safety and things that journalists experience. And I think we certainly experience things in, in all realms and all spheres. And uh, I hope that one of the big things that comes out of maybe this talk and, and this experience is, is just learning how to address that and prioritize journalist safety and also rebuilding trust with, with these people at the same time. Yeah, I, I'm going to pick up on, I think, on that theme about um, the thing that I, I found kind of united all these disparate groups. And as Justin was saying, there was a lot of different uh, types of people there. Um, but their distrust and contempt for journalists was the one thing I found that was consistent through just about everybody. Um, and, but before I start, I, th I think we just want, I want to kind of put this a little bit in perspective. Um, we've all went through kind of bad things uh, at different levels, but it's nothing like what our colleagues are going through we're covering Ukraine right now. And I just I'm gonna put that out there because we have, I have colleagues at my network who are dealing with that too. And they're literally in harm's way. So I'll just put that uh, uh, on the record. Um, so the, the, the tone of the, of the protest changed a lot, I think, from that first day, that first weekend, uh, when it achieved kind of the highest, uh, largest crowd on the Saturday. I think the police said it was around 18,000, maybe. Nowhere close to the 500,000 that the, uh, organizers uh, optimistically predicted that. Uh, and it was also kind of like the most jubilant group that we saw throughout those three weeks. Uh, people there were really having fun. And I, I think part of the reason was a lot of them may have been over the last couple of years been ostracized by some of their friends or family. Suddenly they're surrounded by people. The tailgate party, uh, there's barbecuing going on, there's music, and they're surrounded by people who are, are of like mind and common cause on this uh, issue of vaccine mandates. And I think that must have been really exhilarating for them. And, and, and we heard that from so many protesters, how much fun they were having, and, and they perceived this as just being a really good-spirited, uh, friendly event. And so, um, because I work in television, of course, you know, we are, can't tell a story without our pictures, so uh, we send cameras up uh, everywhere. And on that first day, it went pretty well. I mean, we were expecting uh, some negative reaction, and we certainly got that. We went to try and interview people. We wanted to ask them on, on camera uh, why they came and what issues were important for them. And, uh, you know, I would say on that first day, maybe half the people would kind of turn on their heel and say, grumble something about fake news, and I'm not going to talk to you. But there was a number of people who did, and um, it was really useful uh, getting their perspectives on this and, and and they kind of had a maybe a moderating effect on the others too because people saw them talking to us um, so that first day went went pretty well we had hired private security like like cbc had um and after the first day we we're thinking well maybe we kind of overreacted a little uh but then it changed the, the tone really changed and, and that uh, original group that came on the weekend mostly went home leaving a much smaller more committed and determined group and so then we would send our uh, cameras back uh, up on Parliament Hill uh, every day to, sh to shoot new images. And, and we're conspicuous. I mean, that's the thing about that's different from, from my uh, print or online colleagues is when we send a camera crew into the field, everybody knows us. Uh, they have big cameras that go on the camera operator's shoulder. We have lights sometimes. We have uh, sound people. Uh, often a producer comes with them. Uh, and then there's the reporter. So. Uh, we kind of become a magnet to people who want to express their views about the media. And that really started happening a lot more. Uh, so we had people who would yell the usual things, fake news, tell the truth, you're all a bunch of liars. Uh, the theme about how we're on the, on the government payroll was one we heard a lot, uh, which was bizarre to me, but because uh, we're not, my network doesn't uh, participate in this media fund that seemed to trigger a lot of people. Uh, not that I think necessarily doing so would compromise your integrity, but that was a real a flashpoint for them. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing that was, you know, in those 
that first couple of days is they were really, in, a lot of the protesters were very upset about the reporting of uh, the fact that someone had a, a flag or, or at least two flags with, with a swastika on it and Confederate flags. And they felt that uh, by us reporting that, we had tarred the entire group unfairly and, and they were concerned about that. Uh, even though, I mean, on, on our newscast, we, of course, we would have been negligent not to include that in reporting because it's a scalding image that has, uh, it's enormously offensive to uh, uh, a great number of people. Um, so, uh, but they felt that that was, we'd, we'd portrayed them all as, as a bunch of racists or anti-Semites. So things after, the, you know, in those first couple of days were not going well. Uh, and, and we had to kind of retrench and think about how we're going to do this for the rest. Well, we didn't know how long this was going to be, but we knew it was going to be a while. So we tried to kind of reduce the size of our, of our footprint of our crews. So that meant moving to smaller uh, cameras, uh, smaller crews, um, no sound tax, just going out uh, individually. And they blended in pretty well because everybody at the protest pretty much all the time had a phone out uh, shooting their own images. So we were able to send even our producers out, not necessarily our camera operators, and they could shoot uh, images as well on their phones. Um, so that, that way of uh, adapting uh, uh, worked pretty well. Um, we still had some, you know, uh, we still had those moments where we had to go interview somebody, often through the window of a big rig. Uh, we, of course, identify ourselves, and that would often provoke uh, the same kind of uh, response. Uh, but we, said, you know, we, we, we thought that was going okay. We, we were getting the images we needed to do our stories, and um, to a le with lesser success, we were getting people to talk to us, but we were still managing to do it. And um, I, I give credit to our young producers in our bureau who were really good at that and convincing people, even though we're the, with the dreaded legacy media, that they would still uh, speak to us. Um, but the one thing that was, that was uh, really tough was doing on camps. So at the end of... Uh, a conventional television report, the reporter appears, says a few uh, pithy words and throws back to the anchor uh, to go by different names and we call them on cams or on cameras in our shop, some places call them stand-ups. But um, they're, they're hard to do discreetly uh, because you, first of all, you have to go out at night and you have to use lights and you want to have a backdrop that is reflective of the story you're covering, so that means you want to get as close to the protest as you can. Uh, and then you have uh, sometimes a sound technician uh, along to help as well, and then there's the reporters uh, staring in front of the cameras. And those really became difficult, and they got harder and harder as the protests went on, because we attracted people, just as soon as the light would go on on the, on the, uh, the camera, then people would kind of flock to us. And I, I, I wouldn't say we, it happened every night, but all but maybe a couple of nights, we had really unpleasant negative interactions. I mean, Language thrown at us that's, you know, I hear every day in my newsroom. It's not like, you know, it's not shocking to me. Um, but, the, but the anger and contempt that was being expressed. Uh, and um, we, tr we tried to kind of develop some, or I tried to kind of try some things to deal with it. Uh, you know, sometimes I would just ignore it completely and do like a thousand yard stare and pretend they weren't there. Uh, it didn't usually work. Uh, other times when people come up and start yelling at us and calling us fake news. I'd try and engage with them a little bit. Uh, sometimes I'd be trying to be more personal and say, hey, do you mind if I just do my bit because I gotta go home and walk the dog or see my kid, like, just give me a second. And that usually didn't work. Um, and, 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 and they really just wanted to uh, disrupt it. I mean, that, that was all they wanted to do. They, I mean, people would run into our shots behind us. Um, people would start yelling as soon as uh, I, I started reading my line. Um, they were just determined to um, impede our process. And you know, on, on some of the occasions when I talk to people, with, you know, I'd, I'd feel a little more rambunctious and I want to engage more and, and say, well, the, you say I'm fake news, what's fake about my newscast? And then they would say, well, you're all fake, all you do is lie. And it became evident to me that most of these people who were doing this had completely unsubscribed from my newscast and, and my colleagues' newscast. That, um, and so they couldn't really say what they thought was wrong. Um, some of them did mention the, the depiction of the swastika and the Confederate flags, but beyond that, it was just kind of a general sense. And it was like it was wisdom they'd received from elsewhere and were spreading. It wasn't really opinions they had formed. So that made it very difficult to kind of respond in any way, any way to it. So um, 
and, and then, so we kept trying that, and, and then I, I, think the, like, I guess it was the day the police finally moved in onto Parliament Hill, I think it was a Saturday. Uh, our bureau got a call from uh, MSNBC in New York, they wanted a reporter to do a hit, and I was kind of up in the rotation, and I, I just had this like sense of dread, it was gonna go really badly that day. And so, the camera crew got set up outside on Metcalf, and uh, uh, I went out, I thought, okay, we'll just we'll go up there, I'll get in position, right at the exact time the hit is scheduled for. It's a live hit, so we're like connected live to MSNBC. And uh, so I get in position, I got my noise canceling earbuds in to drown out the people yelling at us, and uh, there's a technical problem. I was like, oh, we can't get the routing to New York. They have this device called Digero that sends signals and it wasn't working and da da da. So we had to stand there for 25 minutes. And as we were doing this, like the crowd gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the point that there was probably 18, two dozen people in our, like immediately around us. And we got one security guy who's trying to keep people back. Uh, Evan Solomon is there trying to talk to people, trying to distract them. Cause he's so he's like such a friendly guy like everybody loves to talk to him he's kind of a celebrity so he's trying to like hive people off away so i can do this live hit uh, but it didn't really work and and finally we get the connection uh to uh this to the studio and then the anchor throws to me and immediately just like a wall of noise profanity screaming yelling like and because it's it's like a little bit like a mob mentality where you have you know people will do things in in groups that they won't do in individually or in smaller groups, and, but so they were just kind of goading themselves into this, and it completely drowned out the hit. And uh, I think the like the the anchor at MSNBC had like no idea what was going on, and then you know she heard somebody screaming some salty language, and she's like, uh, "Okay, thanks," <laughs> and that was it. And they cut her off, and that was it. And so they succeeded. Like those people who really don't like the media and think we're lying about everything, managed to shut down our hit. Um, Pyrrhic victory for them, maybe, you know, uh, but it's, so, and I, I give these examples not, not to try and engender any sympathy for us, because uh, you know, everybody was physically safe. Uh, I, mean, I, I think in the total of the three weeks, there was one incident when uh, uh, Ray Fillion from TVA uh, got physically pushed while he was doing an on-cam, like pushed towards him onto the ground by a protester, who was like really stupid because the, <laughs> the camera's pointed right at this person, right? Um, and then uh, Evan Solomon had a, a frozen beer can thrown at him uh, that missed him, but hit one of a, a, a flight cases and exploded and it hit him and it would have been dangerous. Uh, so I think, I mean, this is something we're gonna have to deal with. It's, it, it, it's, it's gonna happen. Uh, the, the one strategy I adopted and, and then I tried to encourage other reporters in our bureau was, when we would go out to do these on cams, we tell our camera tech, as soon as we get outside the doors, start recording, because I want you to get everything. And uh, you know, in the potential something bad happens, I want to have it on tape, and uh, I also want to have it so that I can put it online, because, uh, and I started doing that. When we, people were coming out and haranguing us at these on cameras, I started putting it online because I wanted to show that this was not a small minority of this group who was here in Ottawa, uh, especially when it got smaller during the week. This was like a substantial proportion, and it was happening every night. It was different people every night. There was a lot of them, but they were united in this uh, belief uh, that the media is lying about them, and um, we can talk about solutions and that kind of thing in a bit, but anyway, Glenn, Glenn, I just wanted to say Glenn, I actually want to ask you a question. I'm, I, we're going to get to Justin, but, but you just said something, but, and you said it in passing, and you said it in a kind of a cavalier way. And you said that something is going to happen. We had a conversation the other day in which you said that it's inevitable that someone's going to get badly hurt, badly injured, maybe killed. And, and, and is that what you think? Like, is that what you... I, you, you know, I think, the, well, I mean, you know, look, I mean, the, the beer can hits Evan in the head. Uh, he's going to be badly hurt. Uh, you know, uh, Ray wasn't, I don't think, injured by that. But, but the path we're but going the, on, the you more, think it's the more, inevitable? The more, the, the more the, you know... The, the more people saw this and normalized that behavior mm -hmm. and rationalized it because, and it, you know, it certainly gets spread online. Uh, we see that, I mean, just the reaction to, uh, you know, when you posted this event on Twitter, the reaction is overwhelmingly negative about it, right? So it's, it's, I mean, I don't know when it's gonna, I mean, if we have another one of these protests, it's gonna be a factor. 
And it wasn't just the protests in Ottawa. I mean, Sean O'Shea down in Windsor, same thing was happening to him. Uh, people, uh, my colleagues from CP24 in, uh, in Toronto, when the convoy rolled into them, they had to basically drive, like run back to their car and get out of there. So, you know, I don't know if it's, it, uh, how, how violent it's gonna get. Uh, we look what happened in the United States, uh, the, starting in 2016, this was a feature at Trump rallies, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I hope not, I hope um, people realize that it's, this is not the right path to go on, and I hope kind of the political leadership kind of redirects them and says, hey, this is not what we wanna be doing. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I'll just share briefly about what it's what it's like to be a photojournalist for this. I mean, I guess photojournalists we don't we often are hidden behind our cameras. We don't often end up on the stage, so forgive me here. But um, you know, I I want to share about kind of what my goals were when I would go out. I mean, I covered pretty much every day except for maybe four or five or six days um, out on on downtown with some uh, some expeditions down to come true didn't see didn't see those but uh, but um, you know what is important for me to do my job is to I have to be on scene we have to be there in person you have to make the pictures you have to show people what they're not seeing uh, if they can't be there and then you have to go file those photos and then you have to go home so those are the most important tasks for me and so I decided that I would um, kind of carry myself in a way that I could accomplish those things every time I went out. Because if I didn't, you know, if I couldn't file, i not do my job. And if I don't go home, that's bad. <laughs> so, you know, I, you want to go home. Um, so I decided from the get-go, uh, the first Friday when everyone was coming in, I was going to start covering um, from a bridge. People were waving flags and uh, receiving honks, I guess. Uh, and so I said, you know, knowing knowing what I know about some of the folks that are gonna be uh, supporting this, I'm gonna not wear a mask. Um, I figured, uh, you know, I've had uh, two vaccines and a booster. If I, uh, if I were to get sick, hopefully I'll be able to get better. If I get into a discussion that turns into something physical, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna have that risk. And my sense was that um, the mask would just draw way too much attention towards that that physical thing that hopefully that didn't have to be there. You know, when you show up with a camera, you change the dynamic immediately. Um, and we're not, you know, I don't want to use my iPhone. You know, that's it's a possibility that you could go out and use a really small camera or something like that, um, which which has been something that's been discussed in various panels that I've listened to talking about. Um, security, especially in the wake of the uh, January 6th uh, events in the States. Um, I wanted to use my, the cameras that I normally use. Um, it's very conspicuous, and uh, like I said, it, it definitely changes the dynamic, so I wanted to reduce the chances of getting into a discussion or into something else that, um, that would impede my ability to work, and I wanted there to be less, you know, to, be, to, to blend in, less, less, less of anything to distract from what I was doing and the people that I would be um, uh, interacting with. Um, and I think that was, you know, that was, that was kind of, a, uh, that kind of shaped the rest of the way I decided to carry myself, um, which was to blend in. Um, and, and we do that all the time as photojournalists. You know, you, you work on Parliament Hill, you know, you wear a suit jacket, you wear a tie. You go to, um, you go to cover a protest, you're gonna wear, you know, your, your, your boots that you can run in, or um, you know, a jacket that allows you to not feel, <laughs> to, to handle the negative 20, negative 25. You, know, you dress to blend in, you dress, um, you dress so that you can, can do the job. And I kind of, throughout the, throughout the covering of the convoy, I you know, figured out different ways that I was gonna actually be able to do my work successfully without having uh, to negotiate different you know, barriers to that. And, and one of those end, ended up being, um, being like having a, 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 like a forward and kind of cheery disposition. So that, that meant that, uh, you know, because folks were so, you know, you got that right away, that they were very suspicious of, of the, the mainstream press, as, as they would say, um, I found that 
interacting with people on a, on a very um, easygoing way would, would actually put people at, I would say, put people at ease. Someone might say, oh, you know, uh, putting them in a good mood or something like that. But um, a lot of the time it would be coming up to someone and, and preempting anyone's negative reaction towards you just by saying, hey, how are you doing? Or like, wow, like, like for a while it was like, wow, you've got so many jerry cans. Um, <laughs> or, like, or like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're filling up this, this, you know, this pickup truck and, and the police, they're right over there. And they're like, yeah, like, of course. They're like, and you get a sense of, of, of who people are in this unguarded way. And then, and then it's like, do you mind if I'm photographing you? And, and then it turns to no problem. Um, in, 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 a, in a good number of, of situations. So I really found that by carrying myself in a, in a way that was non-threatening to these folks, um, I was able to do my job and, and people were like showing, like people were showing me how they were feeling, which is important for me as, um, as I document this to show. Now, I think, um, I think Justin, uh, mentioned something that is part of the crux of the difficulty in reporting this is that there are so many things that are true at the same time that kind of, uh, if you're not able to hold them at the same time, you would say that, you know, these can't be happening at the same time. But, you know, it is true that multiple things happen at the same time in that, you know, you can have a largely nonviolent, you know, protest where people are not actively injuring each other. And you can also have a protest where people are, you know, for example, to bring it back into the local context, people are suffering. So for the visual journalist, that becomes the challenge of how do you depict an event where there are people who are having a great time, who have found a legitimate community with each other, um, that cannot be denied. When, you're, when, when people have come together, are living together, are eating together, um, they have found something true amongst themselves. Um, and then, you know, we talked about, we talk about the bouncy castles and hot tub, of course. <laughs> and then how do, you, how do you frame that among the other currents of what is happening? As a photojournalist, I'm not able to, you know, always be there when something that, you know, something of the aggression, for example, is happening. But the hot tub for me is an example because I think um, that was a good example of where we're trying to show something to set the scene. And, you know, on, on the one sense, the convoy members would have told, would have, would have wanted us to say, look, the hot tubs are here. This is, this is, you know, this is the most fun carnival. This is extremely peaceful. And, you know, that scene, indeed, it was peaceful. There was, you know, there was no violence in the hot tub. Um, <laughs> but what I wanted you to, saw. But that, that I saw, that's my, <laughs> there, missed the fun I, I missed, I missed a number of hot tub openings, but I did <laughs> finally catch the hot tub. I would have been very sad if I missed the hot tub. Um, because it was, it was bizarre, and it was strange. And, this is, and so this is what I wanted to show in the picture of, of the hot tub. Like, you have Wellington Street, but you also have this incredible scene. And the viewer can make up their own mind once they see this. Um, they, can, they could decide, oh, well, it looks like it is indeed the most fun carnival. Or they could see the context of what, the, what is in the image and say, that's kind of odd. There is a hot tub in the middle of the street beside a whole bunch of hay bales on Wellington Street, which is a street. Streets normally don't have hot tubs. <laughs> and then they can, they can make up their minds from there. And that's, I think, what the job of the visual journalist is to do, is to bring the viewer in and say, this is what I saw. Uh, maybe you know, maybe the street's normally a certain way, but I'm showing, I, I'm seeing it a little differently today, and I want you to ask some questions about, about why. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Justin. I, I want to get to questions, but I, I, I get this, there, there's a bit of a division, I think, within this panel. There, there's some folks, you know, Justin, you were saying that you, you, you feel as if journalists performed well during this, during this, this moment in time. Um, Rupa, you know, suggests that, that journalists are part of the problem and, and that journalists, mainstream journalists in this country exist in this quasi, or exist in this echo chamber. Jorge, I'm hearing from you that, that perhaps you think that we're not listening as well or as deeply 
as we need to, uh, that we're not listening to these folks who feel alienated and they feel somewhat detached from us. Glenn, we were having the conversation the other night where you were saying that journalism as a profession has changed. This used to be a blue collar um, occupation. Now, the people who occupy these positions are from the social elite perhaps, in this country. And that that perhaps accounts for the way in which we engage or don't engage. So, so maybe the question, I'm gonna start with you, Justin. Are journalists part of the problem? And, and if so, what do we need to change in order to become engaged again with this population that feels as if we have contempt for them and that, that we don't listen yeah. to them? Listen, I have lots of complaints about, about journalism. I could keep you here all night with my complaints about various aspects of the industry. Um, and you know, Glenn is to some degree right. You know, this used to be a blue collar profession and uh, to a large degree, folks who can afford to do it are the ones who occupy. I, we're using the word occupy a lot and I'm realizing that's a problem. <laughs> um, but you know, and it's funny because like, I'm not from that. You know, I flunked at a journalism school twice. I'm from a coal mining town in Nova Scotia. You know, I'm not from uh, you know, the, the rarefied air of some of the, no offense to the rarefied air crowd, but to some of the journalism schools in Ontario and Quebec. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to the argument that um, journalism has, has gotten a bit detached from um, the everyday concerns of, of folks who live in this country and folks who experience um, economic social hardship. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we have, to, we have to stop playing into the game that just because someone invokes that complaint, they're right. Right? So you know, let's talk about many of the people who, who came to occupy this city. Um, in, in many respects, uh, you know, they are people who have tremendous assets, in some cases you know, owner operators of, of you know, significant businesses, which does make their complaints illegitimate, but you know, they're not um, folks who are necessarily experiencing economic hardship. Um, in some cases, they are folks who lost their job. But let's also be clear, they're folks who lost their job because we wanted them to do something that will stop people from getting sick and dying, right? It's not something we're arbitrarily imposing on them just to you know, get our jollies off and, and crushing the little guy. You know, this was a measure done to make sure that our hospitals didn't collapse, right? You know, this was not a punitive measure. Um, and you know, there's also a significant number of people involved in this who led this, who organized this, who brought people into it who are not um, you know, working class heroes. There are people who have peddled in disinformation, who have peddled in conspiracy theories, who have taken advantage of regular everyday folks who are just frustrated with government and who have weaponized them to their own ends. There are people who have political ambitions, people like Maxime Bernier, people like Randy Hillier, Derek Sloan, people like Ezra Levant, who was suing me, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop there. Uh, but <laughs> people who are trying to build media empires off of this, who are using these people um, to advance their own political agendas. And I think that many of the Conservative Party also have a tremendous amount of uh, blame to, to, to shoulder there, as do some people in the Liberal Party for using them, for weaponizing them in the opposite direction. But nevertheless, um, you know, just because these people are frustrated and alienated from the media doesn't mean that their complaints are necessarily justified. There are a ton of people who are alienated from the media whose complaints are justified and we should talk to more frankly. But I think there's also a, a real problem we have, and this is one thing I think the media got quite wrong in the early days of this, is that we were really willing to hear a lot of these people on their own terms, right? We were, we were really willing to take what they're saying at face value. And frankly, I think Rupa is incredibly guilty of this. She spent a tremendous amount of time during this occupation repeating verbatim what she was hearing from folks who organized and participated in the occupation in a way that I think um, was, 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 you know, not, cr was not critically engaging with what was really going on. Um, you know, there's this little parable about um, uh, a guy who lives in Edinburgh who opens the evening newspaper and sees that um, a, a drunkard outside of London has driven his tractor into a barn. And he, he closed the newspaper and said, well, no Scotsman would ever do that. And the next day he opens up the paper and it turns out a really similar incident happened just up the road from him there in Scotland. Guy gets drunk, crashes his uh, tractor into a barn. And the guy closes the newspaper and said, well, no true Scotsman would ever do that. 
And it felt like that was constantly what we were doing during this. There was these people who were going, yes, 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 he's waving a Nazi flag, but no true member of the occupation would do that. Yes, 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 he believes the World Economic Forum is part of an international conspiracy to enact a one world socialist government, but no true trucker would ever believe that, right? And it's a really endemic problem because at a certain point you have to listen to some of the you know, less savory things these people are saying and proposing and going, well, maybe that's what they really believe. Maybe all this stuff about the vaccine mandates for truckers is a bit of a cover because they know it sounds less offensive than, um, you know, there's a secret, somewhat Jewish cabal that's secretly running the world. Jorge, is, is Rupa right? I think there's, I, 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 I think it's more of a structural thing. I think information, the structure of information has changed where it used to be more like vertical and now it's horizontal. And so the institutions that were responsible for disseminating information and people relied on suddenly have been blasted by what is you know, online and the fact that you know, a thousand people could all you know, do their own live stream reports from what was happening in Ottawa. And I think that structural change is what's changed. I think the fact that authority authority over what is information, what is news, what is truth, what is fact, has now been completely democratized, for lack of a better, but everybody has the power to do what we do within institutions. And yes, there, there, you know, there is an advantage to being in an institution that does journalism. You, it's very difficult to report on Ukraine unless you have institutional backing, you have multiple reporters in, in multiple areas with security, um, that can extract you after you get shot up like those those reporters from Skynet. So, you know, there there are advantages for it, but structurally things have changed and that structural change has just by its nature undermined or, or eroded the trust that the public has in what we do. So I, I think it's it's a structural change. It's not necessarily that we're, we're doing a bad job it's just that's the way the system has is working now it's just it's shattered Ju we are Judy, Judy is Jorge being a little soft <laughs> there and, and I, I ask that be, be, because you have one of your many gifts is that you know you get people to talk to you right you have this ability to get a lot of different kinds of people in different situations to talk to you you were able to get a lot of these protesters to feel as if they could trust you and, and they told you things that they didn't tell other reporters. You perhaps approached this task in a different kind of way. Are we listening in the way in which we need to listen? Are we engaging in the way in which we need to get engage? I am more critical of how we as media are doing it in terms of just the amount of centralization we have. Like if we what were that, to be, if we were to be honest with ourselves, right? How, when was the last time we traveled outside the downtown core to West Carlton to do a story, a daily news story, um, you know, sought out political views of uh, people in Barhaven, right? When uh, a lot of it is geography, we, most reporters would live in the downtown core. So in terms of what they see as story ideas, what they, their experiences, it's, those are the ideas that are coming. Um, it's, it's because we want eyeballs for our online stories. So you know that if you are doing a story about a dense population in the core, you're going to get more eyeballs on it because more people can relate to it. I think that we have to do better. I think that the reason why people uh, feel uh, that they are being heard is because they are getting these alternative news sources and they're being listened to. I think that we need to travel out to the suburbs. We have to travel out to the rural areas more regularly, not just come election time when we do our, our uh, you know, our ward stories or our constituency stories. Like it should be a regular part, and it was. I think it it used to be like we used to. Um, CBC Radio used to have one thing, and I thought, and I think it it should be a regular occurrence, they would call it naked radio, in which they would just basically, you know, on, a, on the map of Ottawa, reporters would just basically choose, you know, blindfold, choose an area, and wherever they land, they would have to like go out to that area, and they would have to come back by five o'clock, and there would be a story. And there was always like 
this this fear, or am I going to get a story? Oh my God, they're sending me out to, uh, you know, they were sending me out to Elma. What's happening in Elma? But they would always come back with a story, and the stories would be great because because people are out there. People, and I think we need to do that regularly. So, like, if we were to look at ourselves critically, we have to admit that, right? That we have just how, in the same way that we've ignored BIPOC populations. You know, it's the, there's also a little bit in which like you're looking at, you know, there, it's interesting that some comments online say that there is no diversity in this panel, right? That we are, but look at this panel. It's very diverse. But they would say no diversity in terms of ideology. Ideology, right? But even if you were to look at what the stories that we have covered, right? So you have someone covering in terms of the religious aspect. You have someone covering in terms of the extremist elements. You know, I focused on police. There are people who are focusing on the politics, right? So this is a very diverse panel in terms of the type of reporting that you are getting. This is a complicated story with so many facets, right? So if we were able to show that, you know, and I, on a regular basis, that we were willing to go out of our zone, we were willing, our comfort, our, our comfort zone, but I think reporters are good at adjusting, right? And I think that for myself, um, you go where, if you don't want, if you want to break something new that hasn't been heard of before, that would stimulate people, that would interest people, you go where, the, where everyone else isn't. So that is something that we should do on a regular basis. Glenn, has, has, has journalism changed? You, you, you've been involved in this, in this business for a while now. Yeah. Um, this has, is a has a profession, has a profession, profession changed? Have journalists themselves changed in the way in which they? Sure, absolutely. But I think the problem we're kind of trying to address hasn't. And, and I agree with Judy that we don't cover um, marginalized communities often as well as we should for a lot of different reasons. A lot of it is the constraints uh, on the industry we've seen. But I mean, I, I remember when I started um, working at the Ottawa Citizen uh, during then a liberal government, and it was then owned by Southern, newspaper was. And so I would do stories trying to hold the Kretchen government to account. And I would get all this criticism saying that this is big corporate media pushing the Bay Street agenda, uh, that you're getting your marching orders from Conrad Black. So there's a conspiratorial. So, so it's a conspiratorial thing. And, and I think this, and, and Jorge, uh, I think, touched on this a, a little bit as, as well with the, the um, World Trade Organization protests in Seattle. Uh, that's a really good point. Um, so it's not the exclusive domain of cons conservatism, although it is uh, right now. And, and I do think these things kind of come in waves, and I th you know, probably tied to you know, problems of uh, inequality and, and economic inequality. I think it's probably a big driver of it too. But that's you know bigger minds than than mine. So yeah, I agree. We, you know, we've got to do a better job at uh, reaching out to uh, uh, marginalized groups. We've been through a bit of a reckoning on this with, with trying to reach out to racialized groups and mixed results on how well that's going. Um, but you know, we saw this in the United States because nobody understood the size of what was a primarily white, rural underclass that was now suddenly a dominant political actor and got Donald Trump elected. Right? Um, great book called Hillbilly Elegy that kind of describes this culture that journalists have completely missed, don't understand it's gone completely on the radar. Is that happening here? Uh, maybe a little bit. But at the same time, I mean, I, I don't think we have to indulge all, I mean, listening to them does not mean sitting down and having them tell us how you're on the payroll for the federal government and you're, uh, you know, you're getting phone calls from the public safety minister, you know, I mean, just all the conspiratorial stuff. So I don't know what the solution is to any of that. So yeah, I agree, we got, we've, we've got to do better at covering uh, those groups, but at the same time, uh, like I say, some of them have just checked out, and, and you're not going to convince people to come back to mainstream media. Raisa, better job? We have to do a better job? I mean, I, it, just kind of going off what, what Glenn was saying, I've been a full-time journalist for less than three years, and so for me, it's, I feel like I joined this industry at a time of, of total chaos. Like, as soon as I graduated, I just said, what the hell? have I done and what have I gotten myself into because you know very quickly after I, I graduated J school it, it was 
you know, a pandemic and everything just seemed to, to go south from there. And so it's a great question in terms of what we can do better because I feel like I've, I've only known chaos. I think what's really important though is that we don't underestimate and undermine people no matter who those people are. And, you know, as Glenn mentioned, we saw that, you know, across the border, we saw that with, with the rise of Trump where that sentiment was made fun of, it was downplayed. And in the lead up to this convoy, you know, I, I heard journalists say like, let's, let's think of that. Let's not repeat that here. But I think, you know, elements of that did creep into the discourse anyway, you know. Um, it, was, it was Diane Deans who said this was a carnival of chaos, and I think the word carnival was, was used a lot. And it was really easy and really tempting sometimes to slip into that mentality of, you know, the bouncy castles, the hay, hay, hay bales, the connect four, the, the hot tub, everything. And it, if I were to, you know, isolate a mistake in, in what we did here, and, and I think for the most part, as, as Justin said, I'm. I'm proud of, of how journalists handled this and covered it, but I think that that did slip into the, the social media discourse, especially just that, that focus on the party element, the, the, the carnival, the, the people having there was a dismissive. Fun. There was a dismissive tone. There was a kind of a contemptuous. Yeah, like it was, it was in jest. And, and, mm -hmm. and I sort of put myself in the shoes of you know, a convoy member in that moment and said, yeah, if I looked on Twitter and I looked to see what journalists were saying about us and, and I was looking at some of these posts, you know, yeah, I would feel alienated and I, I would, you know, be disinclined to speak with them. And so, you know, at, at a very base level, I sort of understand, you know, where they were coming from. In a lot of ways, I, I don't. And there's a lot of trust that, that still needs to be rebuilt. And I, I really do just want to underline that I think that journalists, you know, conducted themselves to the best of their ability throughout this situation. But it just sort of comes down to that idea of, of we can't we can't undermine people yeah. when they have things that they want to say. Okay, Justin, I'm going to come to you, but we should really go to some questions uh, in the audience. And I know that uh, my colleague Beth Popperwell, who has written a fantastic article that all of you should read in the Walrus Magazine, that tells the story of the um, the siege, the occupation, the protest, the demonstration, in, in the most recent edition of Walrus. It's really something that you should check out. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, why don't I just jump in, just so people know, there are, are about 300 people watching this on Zoom as well, and there have been some questions and some comments sure. a lot, but I also want to give a chance to people in the audience, uh, Brett Popowell and Matthew Pearson, two tall guys here, both have microphones, and uh, just in a sec we'll ask, raise your hand if you want to get in a question queue and they'll eyeball you. Um, from the webinar world, um, the next webinar should be about Canadians under siege by the media. Um, another comment on the use of snarl words and purr words in journalism. The very fact that convoy protests is still being characterized by snarl words like siege is part of the problem. A uh, couple comments back to back it was interesting. Do these seven people on this panel uh, believe that this echo chamber will do anything to endear them to people who distrust them? And then right after that, I love this raw authenticity and approach, and I think this is what is missing in the written media. Um, so questions from the audience, and then I'll introduce a few from, mm -hmm. from the webinar.
and want to take a crack at that? I'll jump in and say in short, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, mean, I mean, listen, I mean, like, it, it's undeniable. I mean, I, I think you can look at this party and any sane person would tell you that this is a party that wants to win back the, what, 820,000 votes that went to the People's Party last election, and that is, uh, they consider a, an electoral strategy to victory. I, I, I don't think they're even making a secret out of it. The, the question is, can that party do so in such a way that actually hears their concerns without validating their derangements, frankly, um, or are they going to fall into the pit with some of these more um, conspiracy-minded elements? I'll give you a little parable about this because Candace Bergen was, was photographed, and she actually, one of her colleagues, Marilyn Glad, you actually posted it to her Facebook. She was photographed with two of the occupiers in day four of, of the occupation. They were sitting um, in a restaurant at Laurier, you know, all, all maskless, whatever, um, and, and you're sitting around the table having, having a drink. And um, I asked the Conservative Party, and the Conservative Party said, whoa, whoa, no, she, you know, Candace Bergen just saw them there and said thank you to the truckers because she wanted to support truckers because that's what this is all about. I find one of the guys who is one of the occupiers, and I get him on the phone and I say, well, tell me you know, what, what's up? And, and the guy was actually very, very pleasant, and again, it's kind of the duality of, of the protest, very, very nice guy, you know, was not screaming at me over the phone, we had a very pleasant conversation. Um, and he said, he's like, no, I'm not actually a trucker, uh, you know, I, I own a construction firm and I have a truck, but whatever. And, you know, he, he said, you know, it was really great, she was so encouraging to us, she was giving us the thumbs up, telling us to keep going. Um, and it was so wonderful, and I think, you know, it's great that she's recognizing this about the vaccine mandates. And I said to him, you know, I'm staring at your Facebook right now. You're sharing things that say that, you know, scores of people are dying from the vaccines, and you're castigating the media for not reporting on these debunked studies that say the vaccines are incredibly dangerous and part of this international conspiracy. You know, I said to him, like, do you think it's, I mean, do you think it's wise for politicians to be sitting in, in either meeting with you or negotiating with, with the organizers, considering that you are supporting a point of view that is, you know, kind of a drained, it's a conspiracy theory, and I was upfront with him. And he said, yeah, I hear you, but no, 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 I think we're right. And, and, and fundamentally, this is the problem. I mean, you, a ton of these people are really earnest, and I guarantee you on a bunch of matters from economic policy to you know, uh, healthcare policy, they're really reasonable people who have really valid concerns that should be heard. But when it comes to this pandemic, and when it comes to vaccines, and when it comes to public health policy, uh, and in, in, you know, in, in a couple other fronts, they have fallen into a pit of conspiracy theories. They have exclusively begun reading uh, outlets that lie to them and that take their money and, and return to them nonsense. And if the Conservative Party wants to spend a ton of time convincing those people to come into the fold, I think they're going to fall into the quicksand with them. Anyone else have something to add to that? No? Okay. We do have another question from Next over question. here. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, <clears throat> for coming out and for being here. Uh, my name is Noah. Um, I'm a journalist uh, here in Ottawa, and uh, I did go through uh, the Carleton program uh, a little while ago. Um, I, I just want to touch on this idea of of uh, bias because uh, it's something we hear a lot um, as journalists. And I had a very interesting experience. Uh, I covered the occupation uh, on the first day and on the last day, and uh, it was a bit of an interesting experience because um, I work for CPAC, so our, our uh, parliamentary affairs channel here in Ottawa, and uh, I got asked a lot, are you going to twist my words, you know, what I went up to ask people to talk to me. And I said, I'm here to, to listen and to hear what you have to say because that's part of CPAC's mandate. We, you know, share what Canadians are saying from coast to coast on a variety of issues. And uh, as soon as I described it that way, I got flocks of people wanting to talk to me because I was just there listening, letting them, you know, share, um, as, as Justin would say, a lot of uh, crazy, unbelievable conspirac uh, conspiratorial things. But I, I do want to touch on this idea of bias, like how as journalists um, do, we, do we even believe anymore that we can be fully objective? Because here we all are here, uh, we all have been vaccinated because we're all in this room. So clearly we're biased towards public health measures. We put doctors on television. Uh, we hear from experts who you know, believe in the pandemic, uh, believe in public health. So I guess when we go about our, our daily lives as journalists, like how can we truly be objective 
um, in our reporting and how important is that anymore? Because I know when I was in journalism school, that conversation was just starting and I don't think it's been fully resolved. But I know a lot of younger journalists feel that the idea of objectivity is sort of a falsehood because how can we really be truly objective? I, I don't think you should try to be objective. I think you should try to be impartial. What like, does that mean? Well, you don't approach any story with an end, a, a, a predetermined end. Um, you, just, you, you just go where the story takes you. And I don't think there's one way to cover, um, for example, the, the convoy. There's, there's many, many channels that you can take. Um, I guess by picking a channel, you're getting rid of that objectivity. But when you pick a channel, you try to remain impartial. So I think impartiality is what we should strive for, in my opinion. Are you aware of your biases? Am I? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and what are I, they? Pardon? What are they? Well, um, what are my biases? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm, I, I am partial to um, movements that try to challenge the system. I really, um, I gravitate to those stories. I gravitate to stories where there is high tension and the stakes are, are really high. Um, so when I, you know, when I cover something like that, I have to be very careful not to get swept up in the, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, but you also have an expertise because you've spent a lot of time thinking covered, about these things and, and you've, you've immersed yourself in them. I've covered a lot of, yeah. of civil conflict um, throughout my career, um, primarily through um, you know land uh, resistance with indigenous nations and communities. So I'm, I'm familiar with how the state interacts with with these sorts of situations, and and I saw what happened coming a mile away. The moment that they they went after the Ambassador Bridge, I knew that this was gonna this was gonna end with you know some serious force. Um, and, and when they did the little tour around the airport, I knew that uh, that, that was a huge red flag that I'm, I know within you know, security services that it was taken note of. The moment you start targeting critical infrastructure, different wheels start to, start to move. I, I think the, I mean, we're getting away from, from, from the question in terms of arm pressure side, but in no, terms I think, of- I think it is the, I think, I think okay. it is well, the question. And also, I mean, I, I approached, I took the, the religious aspect of it because I actually grew up in an evangelical church and and a lot of the stuff that I started to see were familiar to me and I actually thought that this would be a way for me to find common ground uh, with people who were involved if I went in and and actually looked to find Christians and then establish my understanding of of their faith views as a common ground um, I would be able to what I wanted to do was understand sort of the life journey that leads an individual to that point. And I, know, I, I knew that there was a lot of hostility to the media and I had faced some of it. So I wanted to, what was, what's the crack that I can find? And so I chose, I chose something that I was familiar with. Um, I'm a religious studies major, so I see religion. And I never graduated from, I never went to journalism school, but I, I see religion in a, in a different way. So I had to check my own, I, didn't, I wasn't going to get into a theological debate about how they interpreted the book of Revelation or, or certain parts of the Old Testament, right? I had, you know, I had to sort of bring that stuff in. Um, I tried to be impartial and just go where, where my interviews and my interactions took me. If I can just really quickly ask you, Justin, like how do your biases affect the pictures you take and you don't take? Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think um, to navigate for a moment away from bias, I think I, I would just want to, you know, my personal view on, on like objectivity in photojournalism, uh, you know, every, everything that you do as a photojournalist, as a visual, as a visual uh, journalist, you know, you're operating a camera is a decision. Mm -hmm. And it's a decision that if you're a step to the left, you're looking at something that could be different. The composition changes, you, you go an inch to the left. Um, and so every, every, everything that we do, th every, you know, th from the lens that you pick to the, you know, um, the setting on your camera can change the way the picture looks. So there is, um, 
objectivity is not something that I that I would you know would profess. Um, I think that I'm looking for context. I'm looking for overarching themes. I'm looking for um, you know the this, what I'm seeing is informing what um, what I'm going to bring my eye towards and the stories that you know the stories that our our um, our reporter colleagues are working on those help to narrow um, to narrow uh, where I'm going to look mm -hmm. and 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 those are you know because once the, there are so many decisions in that way there is no like there is no one uh, there is no that to me that doesn't to me, that takes it away from an, a, a concept of object, objectivity, but I do believe that there is um, an, kind of like an overarching true story that we're looking to portray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question, over here. Struck by Jorge's comment, <laughs> sorry, uh, that the conservatives lost in this kind of equation. and. I just wonder if you could expand on that, because as Justin talked about, there was a really big unification of a lot of groups, not just PPC, not just uh, certain other people. There were racialized groups. There were uh, Every Child Matters flags. There were Black Lives Matter. So I would really like to hear how you expand on how the conservatives uh, maybe didn't benefit from this, because it, it feels a little bit like it was a power grab in some ways with the leadership change and, and other what, aspects. What I, based on, I, I had probably about a dozen on the record interviews with people and I spent hours and every and most of the people I interviewed I asked them who did you vote for how have you voted and and almost all of them said they traditionally voted conservative but they no longer saw themselves in that um, I the, those that did answer how they voted in the last federal election uh, told me that it was PPC but they were unsure what they were going to do next it just, and, 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 and based on sort of the intelligence that they would share with me about how other people um, that they knew that were there, it seemed that most people would have traditionally, uh, according to them, voted for the Conservatives. So that, it seems, based on just my own interactions and who I interviewed, um, that a lot of the people there came from, from that constituency. And, and in a way, you could, I don't, I mean, it's not a perfect parallel, but I think there's a potential, um, because of the, because of the, I think there was some, there was a lot of power to people interacting, and I, I think that that energy is going to continue. Um, it's gonna, you know, they all have their own networks of friends, they all have their families, and I think there is a potential that it could be a, a sort of a tea party type of situation where there is, there is gonna be a strong, a strong constituency, maybe based regionally, maybe based rurally, that will actually have um, power within within the Conservative Party. If if you have certain ridings that, you know, the the majority who put those MPs in, you know, start tilting one way, that you could actually create these these power blocks um, that could have an effect on how that party. I mean, we. It was split before. It was split three ways, right? So it's not a new thing. The fault lines are there. They were papered over. Um, so, so it's not new as well. I'm just, I was just basing it on the people that I actually sat down and talked to. It's almost all of them voted traditionally conservative. Yeah, thank you. Brett. Um, thanks for all being here today. Um, my name's Sarah. Um, I'm a student at Carleton in the master's program in journalism. And I was sort of wondering what your reactions to this sort of quote unquote citizen journalism that presented itself through things like live streams or social media throughout the protest. And as you've all mentioned, um, a lot of people who said everyone I've met has been really great or all those people who wandered around with their cell phones out live streaming everything as it was happening as well and the critique that journalism only covered the bad moments and ignored moments like the people who went and cleaned up the statues or the monuments in downtown Ottawa. And I'm wondering if you guys think that this sort of citizen journalism or live streaming that shows these isolated moments within the protest, if that continues to create division in society and what the responsibility of journalists is to dispel that type of division. I'm gonna ask Judy to take that and then Raisa. 
we can't be everywhere at once. So we use, we have to verify video that citizen journalists take. We have to, we have to take it. We have to say, you know, something happened here. Did this happen? Can we report on it? Can we get to the person? So I think that citizen journalists are important, that there is something, um, that there is value in that. But what I am concerned about is that everyone is considered a citizen journalist just because you have a camera and you're rolling. Like when I'm watching those feeds that are going constantly, what I'm hearing is commentary, right? What I'm hearing about when they are, you know, Jorge was doing the FaceTime, uh, you know, live, live uh, shots of his, of the protests and police move, moving in. But he has that knowledge of being at various protests. So he knows, he can give you that insight in terms of why police are advancing. They're advancing, you know, within increments, like maybe five meters every 15 minutes, right? That this is part of what they do. But a citizen journalist who has never been in a situation like that would view that as violent, as forceful, and that's what they are putting out to their viewers, which is not the case at all. Because if you have covered uh, protests involving racialized individuals, involving indigenous people, you know that the force of police comes so much faster, it's quicker, and so it's just, it, there's no comparison. It's not, you know, an increment of five meters every 15 minutes, nothing like that. So that's what I'm concerned about, is that when citizen journalists are taken at face value and they are just, they're not just explaining what's happening, but they're telling you, this is very violent. Did you see that, did you see that officer? He just, he talked back to me. He didn't, you know, like this is what you're hearing. And I think that's a faulty perception. Just because you have a camera doesn't make you an expert or knowledgeable in what you are seeing, it makes you someone who is experiencing it so you can you know as reporters we we never try to put ourselves in the stories and when we are asked to report on something that we experience we put it in a perspective that we try to like strip it of its emotion right we describe to you exactly what happened to me but i'm not trying to put commentary on it and i think that's my concern about it, whereas I value it because I see some of the video and I know I wasn't there and I know that that's intrinsically newsworthy. I'm concerned about the individuals who are interpreting it um, and skewing what they see. Raisa? Yeah, the citizen journalism question is, is interesting because I, you know, I encountered citizen journalists out there who were, you know, quote unquote, independent. They were not affiliated with, you know, the convoy in any way and I saw many people who were affiliated with the convoy who presented themselves as citizen journalists as well. And it was, what I really don't want to do is police journalism and how journalism should be conducted. I, I don't want to say you should go to J school, you should, you know, intern here, you should work for, you know, a legacy media company. And that's what makes you a legitimate journalist because that's not true. And, and we kind of need to get away from that mentality actually. Um, but it's, it's sort of what Judy said, it's that, you know, being a journalist, you have certain context, you have certain skills, you have certain experiences that you, you bring to the job and that's what you need to do it properly. And it's a little bit harder to verify that or get a, get a clear picture of that with a citizen journalist. You don't really know where they're coming from when they're approaching something. But at the same time, you know, with, with the rise of social media, we're getting that a lot more, we're seeing it a lot more, and you know, whether or not someone labels themselves a citizen journalist, if they're sharing things on social media or putting things out there, they can, you know, if, as long as we can verify that it actually happened, you know, they can supplement our reporting in that way. So I think we're kind of entering a really interesting space in terms of how we sort of coexist together and, and, and where that area of reporting goes. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, just really quickly, Glenn, we were having a conversation the other night and you had a, had a rather modest proposal, I'll call it. You, you, you were saying that you wished that some of these protesters got an internship from CBC. And, yeah, and that, and that, <laughs> just, could, just to kind of, sure, like. Explain. Well, first of all, debunk a lot of these ideas they have about how journalism works that we're, you know, constantly on the phone with the, getting our instructions from the prime minister's office. And also understanding you know, to Noah's question about bias, that 
I think anybody who's worked in the newsroom realizes every reporter has their own set of biases. Very rarely, in my experience, uh, is the predominant bias anyone has a political bias. Right? I mean, I, you know, I've worked with lots of people uh, in lots of different newsrooms, and I don't really know, how, I couldn't probably predict how any of them voted. But I do know, you know who torques the story a little more to this, this side and, 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 and uh, who kind of follows sort of a narrative bias. They tend to follow more rigid story structures. So I think if, you, if you're exposed to those kinds of things, worked in a newsroom and, and saw how it's really done, uh, you would be disabused of a lot of the notions that uh, we're all propagandists for whichever government that you oppose. Yeah. Quickly, Justin. It, I mean, really quick. I mean, Judy's absolutely right that you can't really you know, invent experience. But one really interesting thing about these citizen journalists is, is what Justin was talking about earlier in terms of perspective, right? You know, they were all intentionally aiming their cameras at certain things, right? You know, they wanted to show a, percept a perception of the occupation that, that came from their own bias, which they did not ever declare, right? Um, you know, there was a lot of people standing around filming the hot tub. Not a lot of those citizen journalists were filming those three guys as they, the three guys in the hot tub as they were harassing a TV, TVA crew uh, just an hour later, right? You know, at one point, um, at a press conference on the last day, um, one of the organizers said, I did not see one instance of anyone involved with the occupation being aggressive with police. And I, people in the room from this press conference, supposed to journalists, were going, me either, I agree, yeah, Tom. And I'm just sitting there going, I, I literally an hour ago watched a crew of people try to wrestle the cops to the ground. You know, these people are choosing what they want to see and what they want to show the world. And that's fine, but we should be very clear about that. Alan? I think uh, we're moving in on two hours, so I think I also have to use the prerogative of the chair to suggest a way that we might s start to wrap up. So I would propose a bit of a buffet of several questions that people can pick and choose which one they'd like to answer. There are many, many questions online, and I think I'd like to undertake that we will post those after the fact so that everybody's question is seen. Um, and there's no sense that you're not getting on. It's just everyone's not getting on because we're running out of time. Uh, so I had a question from, the, from here, and then I think we'll take one from Matthew and one from Brett in the audience. A question here, how can journalism productively engage with people who have unsubscribed from the news media and have adopted the skepticism of fake news? Jorge. That's one. Keep that in mind, and let's grab a couple from the floor, and then... Yeah, and I, I have one. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Jaden Dill. I'm a first year journalist, uh, journalism student from Carleton. Um, black and indigenous, uh, well, black, indigenous, and people of color have had their stories oppressed and inaccurately told for years. Black, indigenous, and people of color uh, have had their rights infringed upon in, uh, for centuries and continuously today. But we haven't seen them occupy a city or disrupt the functions of the city. Yet this convoy, primarily made up of white members of the right wing, claims that their freedoms have been violated for a few months. Uh, and it's something that we can't seem to stop talking about and we still are talking about today. So what message is the media sending? Because I'm sensing a kind of privilege. Now I agree, we can't just neglect uh, the occupation of a city nor those on the right wing, but, radicalized, but uh, racialized and uh, marginalized communities have their stories untold on a regular basis. Why is it that when a group of primarily white and right-wing demonstrators claim fake news, we have to reach out to them and rebuild their trust, but when black and marginalized communities develop a lack of trust in media, nothing changes? Those are two big questions. <laughs> and, and I think we need to address yeah. it. So does someone want to address? Can I take yeah. the race one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that there are systemic issues at play here, and that is evident. Uh, in the convoy protest. I mean, it is a protest of predominantly white Canadians, white people demonstrating and the privilege that that brings. The individuals who have been held responsible or accountable so far, Ottawa's first black police chief, Ottawa's first woman police board chair. I mean, that, those are, that should just scream out to you uh, that, <laughs> that there is something wrong. So I, I hear you and I agree um, that there are issues in terms of how media has covered um, uh, it, uh, minority communities and their protests. And, and I would argue also, and I would agree, that those issues are much more pressing 
as to why there is this massive coverage of, of this protest is because this protest was massive. This protest was allowed to grow in scale to a degree because they were predominantly white individuals. If you listen to the convoy organizers when they are talking about how they should deal with police, you have a former ex-RCMP protection agent of the Prime Minister basically saying, I go up to police and I tell them we're just like you, I know you feel me, I know you understand me, we speak the same language. So there are those ties. So there are those ties of systemic issues, racism, discrimination, working together. And I think that that is probably one aspect of the protest that has not been adequately explored and should be explored more. I will do it, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, can, I, can I add such yeah. quick, one quick thing? I think a lot of journalists are allergic to race. They're allergic to it. They're, there's, there's, they're, they're uncomfortable confronting it and talking about it. And I think, and I actually think that the way in which the slowly story initially was not told was really revealing, right? People were so uncomfortable even uh, noting that he was the first black chief in the city. Like there was, a, there was a real reluctance to even engage in that kind of conversation when that was one of the reasons why he was brought in <laughs> to the city, right, to address some of the kind of fundamental contradictions that exist within the community and to address some of like the, the history of enmity or, 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 or the, 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 the tension between the police force and racialized communities. So I'm saying as an industry, we need to become a lot more comfortable, right, talking about race and not, we, we cannot continue to be allergic to it. Anyway, that's my soliloquy <laughs> for the night. Um, there was the other question, though, as well. How do you bring them back? Yeah. I, I'm not sure you can. Uh, I mean, I think once somebody has kind of gone over and uh, checked out from reality-based media and fact-based media and chosen things that uh, confirm their beliefs, uh, and there's a, there was a guy in Ottawa who used to um, walk around, be pre-internet, who used to walk around the streets of Ottawa sticking mimeographed tracks that he'd written, full of conspiracy theory uh, about the Rothschilds, uh, the, the New World Order, all this stuff, and he'd stick it under people's windshield wipers. And his name was Harold Funk. And people would come out to get their car at the end of the day, and they think they got a parking ticket. And they'd always be re relieved to see it was this thing that he had left there. And he was kind of harmless and benign, and I chatted with him a few times, a nice guy. Um, he's no longer with us, but if he were, he'd probably be running haroldfunk.com. And if he had a half-decent web designer, it would be getting as many views mm -hmm. as a lot of other websites. And uh, it was all crazy stuff. Like, it was just made no sense. It was wild conspiracy theory. But it's very hard now to differentiate for a, a, an unsophisticated view, a reader to tell what's uh, right and what's not. And, and then you get into the whole confirmation bias where you're going to give far more credibility to a source that's confirming your own opinions than you would to one that contradicts it. So it seems... I don't mean to be defeatist, but it seems irretrievable. Can I just add one, thank you for that. Can I just add one quick thing, just to clarify? Like, it's possible that race might have been involved with Slowly, but it's also possible that he might not have been very good at his job. <laughs> right. right? Like, I'm saying that that's all, and, and that'll all come out, but th though we, we need to be able to deal with both of those things yeah. at the same time. It's, it's possible that <clears throat> the risk assessments that the Ottawa police did, and this has come out, massive <laughs> blind Plot. spot, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's possible, well, and this will, will, will come out as to how they could have been blind to it, um, that that played a, a factor. And, and I just want to say, you know, you're right. I mean, look at what's happened in, in Caledonia with 1492 Land Back Lane and what happened there. And, you know, very, very little coverage. I was there, that was intense. Um, but 2020 with the Mohawk uh, Rail, um, I can't say it's a blockade because it just parked it next to the rails, but that did, that did turn into a thing. And why did it turn into a thing? Well, number one, because they stopped, it was critical infrastructure, the rail going, you know, the via rail and all that stuff. But that was triggered because heavily armed RCMP went in and, and raided Wet'suwet'en, which happened 
you know, months before this happened. This was all, and, but it's because it was be, between Montreal and, and Toronto or Ottawa and Toronto that, that and, and it was in critical infrastructure that, that people covered it. So yeah, you're right. There is, there is, there is a bit of a, and, and this thing happened in Ottawa's backyard. I, I think the wet suit and raids and, and the type of equipment and gear the RCMP used to go in, that needed more scrutiny. There needed to be media there. Um, also issues with, with trust with media, with the people involved and all that stuff, but you, you raise a good point. And but from you now know, on, we have to start, sorry to do, but we have to start asking when police go into an indigenous encampment or go into a homeless encampment like they have in Toronto and, and use force like we've seen them use in the last couple of years, we should now start asking, how are you not able to deal with this like the Ottawa police <laughs> dealt with the occupation of downtown Ottawa? Because evidently you were able to go and, and clear out a, a, you know, several thousand people who, whose really only leverage was the fact they had huge, huge ass trucks with them. Um, you were able to clear them out with basically zero injuries, zero tear gas, minimal pepper spray, minimal use of force, minimal arrests, no, very little kettling. How come you can't do that with, with other groups? How come you can't do that when you know, it comes to an indigenous blockade or a homeless encampment? Uh, and I think it's a question we, we better start asking from now on. You know, we don't report it, but I will tell you that when I speak to to officers uh, during the protest and they're like, oh, why are you letting those jerry cans go? Why are you, you know, why, why are you not intervening when you're supposed to be, you know? There's an attitude that they're not doing it because it's not real police work, right? Whereas if they are in riot gear, if they're advancing and it, that is policing. But there's also another attitude in which they tell me, goes, well, they're harmless. Like it's a family event, it's bouncy castles. It's like Canada Day, right? So you've heard that a lot. This is a Canada Day vibe. And if, if and, we, and we need to ask this question because the interesting thing is I don't think any racialized minority indigenous group would even dare to fathom that they could take over Parliament Hill uh, or even <laughs> and expect to be treated that way, right? It would, it would not be allowed at all. It would not have lasted three weeks. And I think we, we have to acknowledge that. Like, I mean, Ottawa's last elite, and the other thing is, that's interesting is this was never called illegal from the beginning which Ottawa requires permits for every type of protest, right? So when you have a protest without a permit, the first thing that someone says, they put it out there that it's illegal. So everyone knows that when police advance, this is an illegal operation, right? So the rhetoric at the beginning was they did not have permits, but even media didn't really report. Why didn't we use the word illegal? We said they didn't have permits. Right? So it softens language. And when I say that it's systemic, uh, this is what I'm talking about. I, it's, it's on us, it's on the policing, it's on politics, it's on Parliament Hill. Uh, the other issue too is if the last illegal protest, permitless protest, was November 2020, was a small group of black and indigenous protesters who took over an intersection. So within 36 hours, there was probably about 12 to 15 individuals who stayed overnight. And then uh, around 2, 3 a.m., you had uh, 50 to 60 officers move in and basically dismantle their tent. And the reason why was because they were blocking uh, a major thoroughfare, Laurier, right, and access to the Queensway, right? they could have used that justification to remove any of the protesters within the first week if they wanted to. Yes, police may have been outnumbered and, I, and it's much harder to remove a tractor trailer. So they had that. And that's why they, in, you know, they are, it was thought out, it was smart. Uh, they knew what they were doing. Um, but at the same time, there wasn't that political will and it's arguable whether or not that was because it was a predominantly white group of protesters. And, and Canada being predominantly white, are we going to offend a huge swath of the population who would all of a sudden see police force as, uh, as oh my goodness, you know, did you see that police force? Uh, we can't, we, all of a sudden they're supporting defunding police because there's violence, right? So there's all those issues at play. And we should acknowledge that. Well, 
That was powerful. Uh, <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Are there any other questions? <laughs> any other questions? No? Still right You're there. tired. Are you tired? <laughs> yeah. I think people are almost ready to go. Okay, one more, one more question. I think people are ready to go. Last, last question over here. So um, some of you blended in and got really authentic reactions, and some of you stood out and got disrupted. Um, how did you decide what approach to use, and how did the approaches in engaging with the protesters yield different reporting outcomes? Did your planned approaches give you the kind of responses that you expected? Someone want to take that question? How yeah. approach? Just in the beginning, it's like some of you tried to blend in yeah. and yeah. report. Some of you just went in with your oh, yeah. camera and reported. Which one worked, and was there any difference? Oh, let, me, let me briefly, because I, I, I don't have anything with me. I'm freelance, right? It's just me and my phone. I try and blend in as much as humanly possible. And frankly, it worked. No one ever recognized me the entire time I was there, which thank God. Because um, <laughs> I can't imagine all of them were happy that I was there. Um, but you know, it, it, I think actually I'm lying. There was one guy who recognized me, and it was the funniest thing because he came up and he um, started ranting and saying, "You know, I really like your work, but you're not doing enough to cover the international you know, money cabal that's secretly run." And it was this weird thing where he was castigating me for not covering this conspiracy theory that he had invented, <laughs> uh, but also saying, "I really like your work." I'm like, "This is a very odd experience." Nice chat. Um, but all to say is that um, you know, it, it's a tough thing. Like. To some degree, I actually opted largely not to go and do interviews with people in the street. I liked being a fly on the wall and eavesdropping and listening to what was being said. I did some interviews here and there, and I got a sense of what people were out for, but um, largely I wanted to just be in and of the occupation. Obviously, others took different approaches, which we need a plethora of approaches to cover this properly, but you know, I was very much you know, fly on the wall, kind of move through the crowd as much as possible, spend as much time in the occupation as I can, and it worked really well for me, but also um, I think I benefited from not being too out in public, and I'll just share this with you. you know, the last day I was there, cops were maybe 20 feet um, up in the distance, they were slowly moving people back. And I saw this one woman who had her press credentials out. And I had gone to great lengths to kind of stuff my press credentials in my jacket for most of the week. And somebody had spotted it on her and said, who are you with? Fake news media did the whole spiel. And you know, she's trying to ignore them. And there was people screaming at her. She's all by herself, she has no security. I'm kind of trying to figure out, should I get, get into this? And one of these guys gets right in her face and goes, just you wait, when we beat them, you'll be swinging next to those other bastards up, you know, up in parliament. And this woman's face, like the blood is draining from it. You know, she's literally having this guy saying she's gonna hang her on Parliament Hill. And it was really jarring. And people were just standing around, just kind of laughing at it, like this was just normal at this point. And you know, there is a real risk that people took when they went down there with their press credentials out, with their camera out, with their camera crew in tow. Uh, and not everyone had security with them. It, obviously, it was good that people did, but you know, it was a really difficult thing to be there for those three weeks. Justin, the fact that it seems everyone has a camera now, everyone's a photographer, everyone's a camera person, does that make it easier for you to do your job? Well, you know, in, from our experience, I'm, and I'm thinking my colleagues that I've chatted with, it, it did change the dynamic and it did allow us to blend in and and, and, and uh, have, you know, again, that, those barriers that I talked about, it actually did reduce one of those barriers. We, we were thinking, you know, are we gonna have to go one camera? You know, normally we have two cameras. And, um, and it, was, it, was, it was very strange, because I've covered some uh, protests, uh, like there were some of the BLM protests in 2020 where organizers were really, um, quite afraid of, of cameras that, uh, and were afraid of police using uh, images from, of any sort, including photojournalism, to identify protesters. Um, to contrast that with this, uh, this, this, this event where everything was being live streamed. And, um, and there was actually a funny moment where, you know, a co colleague from Reuters and, and I were, were, were uh, in one of the encampments and this woman is like, who are you with? And, and he was like, I'm with Reuters. And I said, no, I'm with the CP. And, and then I was like, uh, and where can I watch your live stream? And she said, well, I'm not telling you. I said, oh, <laughs> I guess I can't tune in then. <laughs> and Jorge, you had a particular, you know, very particular experience of kind of being behind the lines with your cell phone and, and giving this almost kind of hockey night in Canada comment style commentary. Yeah, so I, 
during the day when the police started to move in, I was live streaming for News Network. Um, my press credentials were out. I usually wore them out. But at night, they wanted sort of seen and just describe the front line. So I, yeah, I went in without my press credentials and I, I drifted through the crowd to give sort of that on the ground image to supplement the cameras that were you know, further back and taken more of a bird's eye view um, because the national wanted to get all perspectives. So um, I just became another live streamer and people saw me with my phone and be like, hey, freedom <laughs> and stuff like that, right? But really, I, I was just another channel streaming, you know, another fragment of reality among a, you know, a, a constellation of them at the same time. Some of those other streamers may have had more viewers than you did. <laughs> <laughs> Not a dig at the CBC. I'm but, just letting but you know. that's, But this is the thing is like I went, I went to, uh, I, I watched a lot of, and, and you had 14,000 or you had 40,000 and you had 5,000 and you had 500. And, and it really, like that is a completely fragmented reality because there's so many. You, you never had a critical mass just focusing on yep. one. Um, and I think that really also distorts everybody's perception of what's happening because even those live streamers would put on their own personality. So I think that's the issue we're facing is just a completely fragmented image of what's happening. You also had multi streams where you had like seven different streams all in yeah, the same Yeah, people, people were just ripping off each other's streams <laughs> and, and they'd get mad at each other and shut them, anyways. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I think we've come to the end. Of, of a really extraordinary session. I'd like to thank Justin Tang, Glenn McGregor, Raisa Patel, Jorge Barrera, Justin Ling, and Judy Trin. Thank you so much for your interventions, <laughs> your contributions tonight. Thank you, thank you Adrian. Uh, this was clearly a conversation that we needed to have, and uh, clearly we've only just begun. And I just thank you, Adrian. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your time. Thanks to all of you. Even Carleton students aren't required to sit for close to three hours <laughs> in a row. So thank you very much. Thank you to those who watched online. And we got to as many of the questions as we could in the time that we had. This is a wonderful space to have a conversation. So Tamara Brown and the team of the Dominion Chalmers Center, thank you very much for helping us to make this happen. And to Carleton and all those who participated. So. Have a great evening, and uh, we will be posting a recording of this and a transcript after the fact. So for those who want to follow up and see more, uh, it, will, it will be there. Thanks again. Thank good night.